Today, we're talking about a topic that is very special to me and a very big part of my life, and that topic is meditation. And I have an incredible guest to talk about that with. His name is Michael Miller. He and his partner, Jillian Lavender, are renowned Vedic meditation teachers and co-founders of the London Meditation Center and New York Meditation Center. They've been practicing meditation for over 30 years and have taught thousands of people across the globe. They were trained under master meditator Tom Knowles, and they've been on really unique journeys that have brought them into a place of coaching many different types of people, including some, you know, very high performers all the way to, you know, regular everyday people like us. Um, well, we're high performers too. And if you want to be an even higher performer, <laughs> start meditating. Uh, I hope you get a lot out of this episode. It actually inspired me to go meditate uh, as soon as we got done recording again, even though I already meditated today, because I was just like, God, I love meditation. Um, they've been featured in Vogue, The Guardian, and The Times. Jillian wrote the book, Why Meditate? Because It Works, which simplifies the science and benefits behind the ancient wisdom of Vedic meditation, which we will link up in the show notes. And Michael has addressed 6,000 people plus on subjects of meditation. Um, and yeah, they just, this is their bread and butter. And he's such a great teacher. I love his approach. It's very approachable for like regular everyday people that might not go live in India with a guru, you know, how to incorporate this into our everyday lives. Um, and yeah, they do all sorts of things from in-person trainings to retreats to, you know, once you've learned it in person at one of their meditation centers, you can join lots of ongoing support online type things. So anyway, if you want to check all that out, we'll link up their websites below in the show notes. And now we will go ahead and get into the magic of meditation with Michael Miller. Okay. So Michael, I'm excited to dive into the topic of meditation with you today. And I know that, you know, what you teach is Vedic meditation. And I'm just wondering if you could sum up what Vedic meditation is, what meditation is for somebody, you know, from your perspective of someone who's doing it day in and day out. Absolutely. And Tara, let me say thanks so much for, for having me on. It's really so nice to speak with someone who's engaged in this kind of work and, and really excited about it. So yeah. Vedic meditation comes from the Veda, V-E-D-A. The Veda is the body of knowledge that comes out of ancient India. It is from which we get meditation and yoga and Ayurvedic medicine. The Veda can be traced back certainly 5,000 years, probably 10,000 or more, depending on the scholar you speak with. So this has passed the test of time. <laughs> yeah. It was not, you know, thought up by some sociologist in the 80s. And we like that weight of history. I do always like to say, you know, it's not it's not Indian. And I put that in in quote marks or in, in speech marks. It's not Indian in the sense that you have to take on a belief system. You're not adopting some philosophy. This is a simple mental technique practice sitting in a chair. So we're about being comfortable. You're not cross-legged in the middle of the room. You don't have to be perfectly upright. You sit back, your back is supported. You sit in the chair, you close the eyes, and you think to yourself a little sound, a mantra that is chosen and personalized for you by the teacher. Now, I think a lot of your audience will have heard, and this this is, term is is so in in general use now mantra mm -hmm. but this is a specific kind of mantra mantra it the word itself actually comes from two sanskrit root words manas for mind and tra for vehicle or instrument so mantra is literally a mind vehicle it's something your mind climbs onto and gets carried somewhere else these are called bija mantras and bija mantras have no intended meaning. So this is not working at the level of intellect. It's working at the level of vibration. You think this little meaningless sound inside the mind, and two things happen. It self-refines. It gets more quiet and more subtle. And at the same time, it's fascinating. It is so charming to your mind. Your mind just finds it so interesting. And this is what your mind is doing all the time looking for what's more fascinating, looking for greater charm. And so the mind starts moving toward the mantra. Mantra is getting more quiet, more subtle. Mind follows the mantra into the most subtle layers of thinking. 
And then the mantra does its final little trick and it disappears. And for a moment, your mind drops into this state of no mantra, no thought, pure awareness, a field of being. And that is a very powerful experience to have with intent. Yeah, this is why it's really nice to have knowledge. It's kind of just like, okay, like somebody figured out how to get maple out of a tree, right? So thanks for passing that. Hey, there, we didn't have to figure that out. Like somebody just kind of pass it down. Hey, there, you just stick this thing in here and you can get maple out. It's kind of like that in terms of understanding. It's like a homey hookup from thousands of years ago of like, try this. It'll help you get into that state. It'll carry you into that state a little you know, More. this is re this is so yeah. wise of you because meditation is easy when you know how to do it. Yeah. And it is natural. You know, that state of what we call transcendence, of stepping beyond thinking into pure being, that is a natural state that we all experience in the mm -hmm. little gap mm -hmm. between wakefulness and the sleep state of consciousness. You pass through, you, you step through that space as you move from the sleeping state into the dreaming state back into the sleeping state, coming back, you know, that moment as you're half awakening and you're not really fully awake yet, but you're no longer fully asleep. The mm -hmm. in-between scientists call, the, call this the hypnagogic state. Mm -hmm. That is very much like transcendence. It is a natural state. What meditation does or what we're doing with Vedic meditation is uh, accessing a technology in order to experience that state regularly and systematically. And, and that requires some, some training. Skills. Yeah. Yeah. You know, could you figure out how to do it on your own? Maybe. Could yeah. I figure out how to build a bicycle on my own? <laughs> Maybe, you know, I see a bicycle right. go past. I think that's cool. I'd like to have a right. bicycle. I learn how to weld I figure out, you know, some sort of drive chain and some braking mechanism. And a few years later, I have a bicycle kind of pieced together. Or I could go down the road. I'm in Manhattan right now. And just down the street is a fancy bicycle shop. And they have in the window an amazing Italian road bike. There's a few hundred years of expertise right. in that machine. Right. I could just jump on that today and be off and riding. Some people want to learn how to build a bicycle. Fine. Right. Most right. people with meditation don't need to start from scratch. They can tap into the wisdom. Yeah. I think this is such a great point because, you know, I, I, I told you before the show, meditation is part of my morning routine that I have my clients do and has been for many years. And one of the biggest questions that I get is like, or comments that I get is, oh my gosh, it is so hard for me to meditate. Right. Yes. And so let's kind of, there's so many questions I want to ask you. I definitely want to hit on like the results and benefits and like what you see happen in people's lives as a result. So don't worry guys, that's coming. I can't wait to talk about that, but like, okay, you take somebody who's stuck in that typical American, go, 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 go. Even if I have a minute, I'm going to fill it with something more productive. And I've got to go, 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 be somebody, be somebody. <laughs> right. I'm talking fast for a reason, because that's the energy, right? Yes, 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 yes. And so you're taking someone and they're like, you know, people have a really, I'd say it's way easier for people to mentally connect to adding something into their life. But when that adding in of something is letting go mm. <laughs> and not doing Whoo, people struggle with that, right? So people will do, you know, they do Calm and they do the Calm app and they do Insight Timer and they do YouTube series and they bought somebody's thing. And I still see that people, it's, um, there's a barrier. It, it's like, I don't know if it's the dopamine drop or what, but pe they, like, it is just like fighting it tooth and nail quite often. And a lot of people is like, uh, like I don't have time for that. I don't know how I'm not even getting there. I'm thinking the whole time. What do you say to those people who are just starting to build a practice? I say, I get it. And it was my experience. Yeah. You know, I first encountered meditation 30 some years ago. I was at university. I had a professor who was a bit of an old hippie. You know, he'd meditated mm -hmm. in the seventies, thought we should do it and gave us a little time in, in class one day. And I sat down, cross-legged on the floor, took a tennis ball out of my bag. Why was that in my bag? I don't know. Cupped that in my hands, 
stared at the seams of the tennis ball furiously for what <laughs> felt like the longest 10 minutes of my college career. My mind was all over the place. Right. But interestingly, in, in that time, there was a little settling down. Like I could feel something happen. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, there clearly there's something to this. And so I went on a search and I spent better than 10 years chasing after that moment, doing different types of meditation. I did a lot of yoga and body work and energy work. And it was all interesting and none of it clicked or stuck because every time I sat down my, by myself, which wasn't very often, I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't sure what was supposed to happen and yeah. I didn't have any way to gauge it. So I would just sit down, sort of clamp my eyes shut and try to do something without knowing what that something was <laughs> or how I would know when I experienced right. it. Like it was right. so wishy-washy. Right. One of the biggest mistakes, the myths of meditation is it's hard work. And it should not be hard done properly. The other one is what I'm going to learn is how to not think. Right. And I don't know how long that's going to take, weeks, months, maybe years or even decades. But one day, if I really stick to it, I'll sit down and I'll just have this single pointed focus and all other thoughts will stop. And this is not going to happen. Right. It's really important. Now, there, there are techniques of meditation that are concentration styles. Focus on the candle flame right. or just grit your teeth and close your eyes and don't think, don't think, don't think, except then I'm thinking, don't, don't think. think. And that's right. another thought. And I'm going to catch 22 from the very <laughs> beginning of trying to use thought to stop thought. Right. And it's super frustrating. And people yeah. who practice these or try these, very few people actually do it regularly, but they'll come and they'll say, I don't know if I can meditate. I just recently, a guy said, do you think I'm undiagnosed ADD? <laughs> like, right. Right. Because yeah, the mind that. is designed to move and right. trying to hold it in place is a is a losing is a losing battle. There is this, you know, there's another style of meditation, open monitoring, commonly known as mindfulness. And there's a little bit of concentration here. Bring yourself to the present moment and keep yourself there. So focus on the breath, keep coming back to the breath or maybe do the the example I like to use is doing dishes. You'll know, be mindful. Right. Just do the dishes. And just do the dishes, right? right? Just do the dishes. Just do the, ah, don't think about the email I got from my CEO today. Do the dishes. Right. Do the dishes. Wait, right. now I'm plotting how I'm going to respond to her tomorrow. <laughs> just do the dishes. If the present moment is filled with stress and fatigue, yeah. it can be difficult to get into that moment and, and sometimes uncomfortable to remain there. So- you know, the most important thing is effortlessness and ease and simplicity. The mind naturally wants to move to a more settled state. It is natural to alternate between rest and activity. You know, these clients of yours that you're talking about who are go, 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 go. No one would, you know, no Formula One driver would get in a car and just drive as fast as they could around the track until the engine failed and then get towed in and try to repair it and get back on the track. But that's what people do with themselves. Now, that's how most people operate. A few more shots of espresso and, you know, I'll work out super hard and that'll blow off a little bit of stress and I'll just go, 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 go until I hit a crisis point. Yep. And what is that crisis? I'm emotionally completely strung out. My body starts to break down. My relationships fall apart. I start using chemicals other than just the normal ones in order to get me through. I have strained the system to a point that nature says, you have to make a change. And then I do something. You know, I take six months off work and I go live in Bali and I feel better and I come back 
And then I just get back on the track and I go, 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 go until it happens again. And it's not sustainable. You know, you can, you can only take so many holidays. Mm -hmm. What does the Formula One driver do? Pulls into the pit regularly. Right. With, with, with an intention, you know, pull in, get tuned up, get back out there. And that's what proper meditation does. And when you, when it's framed in that way, and you have that experience of actually meditation is not about withdrawing from life, but it's about de-exciting so that I can slingshot back out and actually engage at a higher, more effective level, then it doesn't feel like this big sacrifice. You know, no one has ever said to me, it was really tough to get my meditation in this afternoon. Oh, it was really tough. You know, I had to put off responding to some emails and I had to cancel a phone call. And, you know, I had to sit in the back office in, in the building that in a not very comfortable chair. And afterwards, I really regretted it. <laughs> yeah. I really wished I'd sent more emails and said, no one has ever said that. Right. When you actually do it, it is always worthwhile. Totally. But if you sit, but if you don't know what you're doing, or you're doing a practice that is hard work that's not designed for you, then it is going to be a little bit of a struggle. So let's talk about like if I was listening to this and I didn't have a consistent meditation practice, I think what I would be wondering is <laughs> this question is probably going to drive you crazy as a meditator. What's the point? What's the point? Why, like, why, why should I do that? Why, why, what am I going to get out of it? Right. I would be wondering, I mean, that's like, it, if we're talking about, uh, you know, cold showers or something, it's like, well, why, like, what's the point, you know? So, yeah. well, I, I like to think of it in terms of ROI. If I'm going to sit around with my eyes closed for 40 minutes in a day, and this is what we recommend 20 minutes in the morning before breakfast and then 20 minutes late afternoon, early evening before you have your dinner. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other things I could do with 20 minutes twice a day. Mm -hmm. I could practice my French and I could learn to knit and I could call my family more, my extended family more often, stay in better touch. If I'm going to choose to close my eyes and meditate, I need to know what I'm getting out of that. Yeah. And I, I think this is, it's a really important, important question. Mm -hmm. When the mind quietens down, think of it like a wave on the ocean, the wave of your individuality settles down, settles down, settles down, and then flop. You have this moment where you touch the underlying ocean of awareness that is your source. Yeah. That is the source of your energy and your intelligence and your organizing power and your creativity and your yeah. compassion and your happiness, they all come from that place. You touch that. When you then come out, those qualities in you are engaged and enlivened. So you sit down for 20 minutes, you come out, you feel emotionally balanced. You mm -hmm. feel mentally sharp. You mm -hmm. feel energized and ready to engage in the world in a really different way. I could tonight, you know, I have enough on my to-do list right now, and I'm sure you do too. I could skip a night's sleep and just work straight through the night. There is enough for me to do that I could just, you know, you remember those caffeine tablets that people took <laughs> with when they were in school to, to pull an all-nighter in order to get up the next morning. Oh, it man. never worked for people, but they, they did it, you know shoot up with caffeine, really go for it, plow straight through the night, really crank through my to-do list. There's no way I'm going to do that. There's no way I'm going to do that because I know I'm going to pay for it tomorrow and it's not worth it. Rest is the basis of activity. Yeah. Deep rest of meditation is the basis for very dynamic activity. And this technique, Vedic meditation, is, is unique in that if we measure your body, if we measure your oxygen metabolism during meditation, what we see is in a few minutes, you are resting two to five times more deeply than sleep. There's really profound rest. So when I learned, I mean, when I first learned, I was exhausted. 
first week, I was completely wiped out. You know how you go on holiday and you yeah. think, oh, I'm going to explore this new city and you collapse in your hotel room for 18 hours <laughs> because mm -hmm. you had no idea how tired you were until yeah. you slowed down. This happens so often for people when they learn to meditate. They feel really tired. It feels like the opposite of what I wanted. But then you start to pay off that fatigue debt and you then start to move into the black. You build up this, this bank balance of mm -hmm. energy and adaptability. And so two weeks into meditation, I was sleeping an hour less than I had been prior. I was waking up before my alarm. I was maintaining energy, getting through the afternoon without a triple chocolate muffin break. You know, it was really noticeable, the difference. And the mental clarity was really different because I would get up and I'd go into work. I'd meditate first thing, go into work, look at my to-do list. And I, I looked at it and I thought, these things don't belong on my list. These three things should be on someone else's list. And I'd offload those things. Right. And then I'd look again, I think, oh no, no, oh, no. Number 18 has been on the list for six weeks is actually mm -hmm. important. And yeah. I'd move that to the top. Right. And when those bigger, more important things were getting addressed, little stuff fell into place. And there was this sense, there was a real sense of a net gain of time. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the biggest thing. People say, I don't have time to meditate. I remember a few years ago, I taught a, a film director, uh, lived in Brooklyn, and he was really, he just loved it. He was so on it for a couple of years. He was really twice a day meditator. And then he got a really big film and the demands were such, it, it kind of fell away. And the moment they wrapped, he emailed me and said, listen, I need a private session with you. I need to get back on track. I don't have time to not meditate. I thought it was so beautifully phrased. I've told the story so many times because he could feel his lack of focus yep. and a, a lag in his efficiency compared yep. to what he was doing before. He was like, I, I've got to get back on this. A hundred percent. And you know, you kind of talked about settling into that like source energy. I mean, for me, the way I stumbled into meditation was I was starting my business and I was this hungry new entrepreneur that was reading every book I could get my hands on of every, you know, mindset great to business leader to Phil Jackson's book, like just anything of, you know, expansive I was reading. And I just kept coming across so many people that were saying, I attribute all my success to meditation. Oh, and I'm going to masterminds as ever. It's like everybody there apparently does transcendental meditation or like, what's all this, you know? And, and I just saw it so many times. I was like, well, I'm smart enough to know to model patterns of success. So if all these people are saying they pretty much owe their entire success to meditation and Phil Jackson's got, you know, Michael Jordan and these guys doing breath work and meditation activities. And then they're like winning the world, you know, the best in the world, all the way to Ray Dalio from, you know, his book principles. I don't know if anybody read billionaire, you know, it's just like meditation, meditation, meditation. I'm like, I have to be stupid not to incorporate this into my life. And I'm already a spiritually inclined kind of person. And so being able to tap into that source energy consistently, I understand why these people are saying those things and why when I'm like, when he's saying creativity and executive function, it's just, it's more like you are, you are the observer of your life, right? Like that, and I see that constantly in my clients too. Like it's pretty quickly, as soon as they get into it, they're like, they're observing themselves. And that's part of why I have it in my mindset coaching is because I need them to be able to zoom out and be the observer. And so and they get into this less judgmental energy of, oh, that's interesting that I'm doing that. Oh, and you know what? I really, that's why I'm doing that. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm gonna, And it's, it's this way more neutral observer energy versus this, you're in the thick of it of, I can't believe I ate donuts last night. Got to stop doing that. Now they're just in like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what led me to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think next time I'll do this. Right. And so it's that way with, business. It's that way with like your interpersonal interactions with your habits. It's kind of like uh, Victor Frankl's famous quote from Man's Search for Meaning. I'm paraphrasing it, but between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power. When you meditate, that space gets bigger. 
You're so you're so right. And Tara, what you're talking about is consciousness. Yeah. Awareness. Yeah. And there are there are three aspects to consciousness that is so for uh, expanded consciousness that are so important for the kind of people you're talking about. One is greater discernment, the ability to detect fine differences between mm -hmm. things that seem the same. Here's mm -hmm. this thing. Here's this thing. If I'm stressed out and strung out and worked up, right. I don't know, I just pick one. Right. If I'm clear and alert, I can see the fine difference and I make a better decision that leads to a better outcome. True. More consciousness, broader awareness. Yeah. The ability to hold more things in our field of vision. So if I'm in fight or flight, if I'm stressed out, I narrow down. And it's a little bit like a zoom lens. You know, mm -hmm. you zoom in, say, on the rose. The rose is in focus. You know, so mm -hmm. this is, you know, I'm really going to work on this thing and I'm all focused on that. But if something of importance pulls my attention away, now this is lost completely. Right. And I, it's kind of hard to find my way back. I always think of people when you're working in an office and you go over to ask somebody something and they're in front of their computer and they're like, wait, 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 don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. <laughs> because right. if they get pulled away from whatever it is they're doing, who knows if they'll ever find that train of thought again. Right. So broader consciousness is like a wide angle lens. With a wide angle lens, the rose is absolutely in focus, but mm -hmm. the field is broad and available. And then if something of importance or even just of interest comes into the field, I can shift my attention and yet return back. Yeah, I've got it all in there at the same time. Now put these together. I've got this broad field of awareness with all of these things within it, and I can detect the fine differences. I start to see trends and patterns. And this is where someone can step back and go, oh, how interesting that when that sales call went poorly, I had half a dozen donuts. <laughs> you right. know, And I was right. missing it before. I was right. missing it. All I did was beat myself up for having half a dozen donuts, and I beat myself up for not being good on the sales call. Yeah. If I can step back and put two and two together, oh, now I've got an opportunity for change. Yep. Now I can see this. And people will say to meditators, how did you know that? <laughs> you know, It's almost like you know what's going to happen next. No, no, no. It's, it's not some mystical predicting mm -hmm. the future thing mm -hmm. it's you are in the present yeah you are available to what is here in the moment and in present moment awareness is power because the seed of the future is here right now mm -hmm. everything that's going to happen exists in seed form and if you can detect that and you can see how it's going to elaborate then you're going to find yourself in the right place at the right time, you're not going to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here in Hawaii, the present moment is highly valued culturally, and it's been an amazing experience for me. Like it's almost, not almost, it is quite socially unacceptable to be distracted. Like you wouldn't want to be in a coffee shop, like waiting for your coffee, like all on your phone. It's kind of like, it's everyone's here. We're all here. Like everyone mm -hmm. is aware of everyone. And so when somebody's kind of lost in a device or law, it's kind of like you just notice that they're not here, right? It's this really insane thing. And it's so cool because there's better acknowledgement of like human to human. You have an actual interaction when you walk past a stranger. It's like an actual acknowledgement of your presence and like, you know, a little bit longer, maybe eye contact than other places where you do this half smile kind of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, if I even acknowledge you, I'm going to like barely move my mouth and like dart my eyes away quickly. Like that gets lost because culturally it's more uh, encouraged and normal to be more present, you know, and it's been a really cool experience. I kind of recommend for any uh, meditators spend some time in Hawaii because that's just um, valued here being yeah. busy and not having time for people is not it's it's actually like kind of looked down upon it's like 
it's, well, it's with you, love with love it's kind of like hope you're okay man like yeah. ooh. and it's interesting <laughs> when when you are in the moment and available to others in an environment where that's not the norm i remember teaching in in london <laughs> taught a taught a guy who was a, a you know high end corporate lawyer and he he came came back and checked in after a few weeks and he he said the strangest thing people are complimenting me on my eyes. He said, I had like five people in one day. <laughs> now, <laughs> when you got up close and you talked to this guy, he had amazing crystal clear blue eyes. Like his eyes had not changed. He was making eye contact with people. Mm. Now, he was he was actually looking people looking at people. Right. And he was available to be right. approached. And that's a really interesting thing mm -hmm. you know meditation changes relationships now it is a big big thing that happens and the trend overall that meditators report is more friendliness yeah and more compassion yeah and more happiness in their interactions though i always like to say it's not the only thing that can happen you know if you are in a relationship in which you're being treated in a way that does not match your yeah. sense of personal deserving power, yeah. you can find yourself stepping up and actually being more direct. And it's an important thing, again, because this is not about turning into some spaced out bliss bunny. <laughs> you know, I'm a right. fan of peace and love and happiness. Right. And that's not the way the entire world is operating. Right. And coming with that is not always appropriate. And when you have broad consciousness and when you have adaptability, it's about responding in an appropriate manner. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we teach, we don't tell you, you need to stop drinking coffee and eat more kale and feel mm -hmm. love and compassion for every living being. You mm -hmm. know, we don't give any rules like that mm -hmm. because nobody needs a new rule, rule book. Nobody needs more commandments. Mm -hmm. People know how they want to be in the world. The question is, can they do it? Can they do it? And if they're tired and if they're stressed, it becomes all about number one. And yeah. people get aggressive and angry when they should yeah. be patient and understanding. Or they get lethargic and non-responsive right. when a situation is asking them to step up and be perspective. And so people come into balance in a way that is appropriate for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you're making me think of when I first started, the first uh, thing that I noticed after, you know, of consistent practice was that I was less reactive to pings, to texts, to anything. Like I was, I, I've, I, you know, I'm doing something and see a bunch of texts coming up. I'm like, they can wait, mm. you know, or, um, instead of engaging with life and this kind of frenetic energy that I was in at the time, cause I was in a lot of like trauma and survival. And like, I was like, sleep when I'm dead, you know, <laughs> like <Right. laughs> my adrenals got this, you know, uh, survival. You're, Dro you're speeding up the chances of being dead by having yeah, that yeah, attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I, it's not that I, okay, that that's not true. I was going to say, it's not that I stopped doing as much because I did. I, I, I was able to let go of things that didn't matter more easily. I was still having to produce at high levels at that time, but I was engaging with it so much more calmly, you know, yeah. and that I'd say is something I see in clients a lot. And I'm sure you have too. It's just your way of being. It's like you're settled into your own physiology. It's, it's, it's safe to just engage in a more calm and slow way. I'm not saying I don't get goofy and crazy and silly still, but like my day-to-day -day mode is not like, go, 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 go still doing the same things. I actually feel like I have way more time. Yes. I'm engaging with them more calmly. And that has been a complete game changer in my life. Have you seen a lot of that with your students and yourself? Yeah, so much, so much. Because most people, as you say, are running on adrenaline and caffeine. And you remove that and you make better choices. Yeah. You see more clearly. 
and you you use appropriate amounts of energy instead of just kind of blowing blowing it off and right. you know you're changing your neurochemistry you're you're producing well there's something called molecular weaving that happens very interesting so stress chemistry is in the body what happens in the mind prints out in the body so someone you know someone is feeling anxious their brain starts to produce the the, the neurochemistry of anxiety and we can measure that in their saliva and in their tear ducts and in the sweat on the palm of their hand. If they stop feeling anxious and they start feeling angry, those chemicals tear apart. This is the molecular weaving. Chemicals tear apart, they reform into the neurochemistry of anger. We can measure that in your bloodstream and down to the marrow of the bone in just a few minutes. Wow. The body is a printout of what happens in the mind. In meditation, the mind quietens down and it touches this quiet, blissful state and a whole new cocktail of neurochemistry comes about. Mm -hmm. Anandamide, dopamine, serotonin, all these chemicals that are associated with happiness and well-being and health and longevity. You are changing yourself at the chemical level by meditating. And it's a it's a reset. It's a reset because that is your natural state. It's not natural to be right. worked up and stressed out. You know, look at toddlers. Right. They're basically happy. You right. know, they fall down, they scrape their knee, they cry a little bit, and then they sort of giggle and they run right. off. As adults, we've gotten into these grooves you know, we've sort of locked in and, and we trend toward a certain neurochemistry that reinforces, and I feel this way and it creates a neurochemistry and then I feel more that way and I get stuck. Yeah. And what meditation does is resets that back toward what is natural, what wow. is natural. And that is to be more light and to be flexible. You know, for right. it's why heart rate variability changes with meditation goes up right. you know, because you are available to input. If your heart is just pounding away, it's because you're stressed and locked in and there's no change. If you're available for little impulses from nature, ooh, that person, oh gosh, that look at that beautiful thing. Oh gosh, I need to address that. Your heart rate is changing yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's a sign that you're open and available right. and adaptable. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, last question. Um, what are just some of the other, I guess I'd say benefits. Yeah. What What have you seen happen in people's, you've been doing this for a while. So like, and, and, and so broadly, like what have you seen happen in people's lives as a result of building a meditation practice? I've had three women come to me after learning and say they got accused of getting Botox after they learned <laughs> to meditate. Nice. <laughs> right. Because, you know, everything just we hold softened. so much, everything right. opened up and got softer. One woman came and this was the reason she learned. She said, I bumped into my friend. I asked her if she'd had work done. She said, no, she learned to meditate. Aww. The woman said, this is the only reason I'm here. Oh, <laughs> I love that. She sounds fun. It was great. <laughs> and she turned out, it turned out she loved it. Yeah. And that wasn't really the reason she You're was right. there. Of course. Of right. course. Yeah. You know, people come to meditation because they want to change. Mm -hmm. No one comes to meditation because life is perfect, but they're not sure what to do with 40 minutes in their day. Right. You know, people come because they want to see an impact. Yeah. So, you know, I remember a, a woman who came terrible insomnia, had not, her report was she had not slept through the night uninterrupted for five years. Mm -hmm. And the third day, of the course. So the, the course that we teach is four sessions over four consecutive days. Okay. It's just two hours each day. And mm -hmm. at the end of those four days, you're a self-sufficient meditator. You have nice. a technique that you can get on with. She learned on the first day. On the second day, we talked her through, you know, here's how you fit in into your life and this is how you do it exactly. And then on the third day, even before we could get to it, she said, I slept through the night last night, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to jinx it. We said, okay, well, let's just talk about what's happening with meditation, unwinding the stresses and the impressions in your system and how that changes you 
over time. And then she came back for the fourth day and again had slept through the night, two nights in a row. Wow. Awesome. After years of not sleeping. Now, not everyone has it that quick, but it's interesting how often people feel more wakeful and more energized during the day, no matter kind of what's happening with their sleep totally. at night. We're, yeah. we're a little sleep obsessed in our society because it's <laughs> the only way we rest. Right. And sleep is mediocre rest in comparison to meditation. Mm. You know, if you can be resting five times deeper than sleep, then if you don't fall asleep the moment you lie down, you don't worry because you get up in the morning, you meditate and you actually wow. feel, feel okay. So mm -hmm. sleep is, is a big one. Anxiety is a big one. Mm -hmm. I taught a, a columnist from the, the New York times and on, uh, on the, over the weekend of the course, he came in and he said, he said, I woke up this morning without a pit of anxiety in my stomach for the first time in memory. Like what mm -hmm. is happening? And I said, well, let's, let's see, you know, that you woke up feeling good fantastic maybe that's because of meditation let's keep mm -hmm. meditating and let's see mm -hmm. what occurs and i saw him a year later and he said that's stuck i have never gone back to <laughs> quite the same which you know he said it's not that i don't get a little worked up here once in a while right. but right. i've never felt like that again mm -hmm. anxiety sleep these are two really big things and ability to speak your truth yeah. You know, to be who you actually are, to be more yeah. authentic. Yeah. And, you know, then that has an echo in the rest of your life. You, you become that person that you like to be around for yourself, but for other people. You know how you, yeah. you know, you go into a business meeting somebody shows up and you're like, oh no, this whole meeting has just gone downhill because so-and-so is going to sit in on it. And it's, it's, it's not what they say necessarily. It's, yeah. it's just the they drag the whole atmosphere down. Mm -hmm. And you know what it's like when you're going out with a group of friends and somebody shows up and you're like, oh, this whole night is going to be better because this person mm -hmm. is here and not because they're going to buy and not because they're a clown but just who they are lifts the environment. Yeah. You become more and more that person. Totally. You know, meditation is good for you. It's good for your health. You are healthier when you're meditating. Yep. It's good for your brain functioning. Your, your prefrontal cortex gets activated and you get a much more bi-hemispheric, coherent brain functioning. Your critical and creative thinking skills get better as a result of meditation. Your emotional state smooths out. You move away from the spikiness of anger and anxiety back toward clarity and calm and happiness. You sleep better. You feel better. All these great things. And this is the most generous thing you can do for the people in your life. Yeah. Because people in your life, you know, oh no, I can't take 20 minutes away from my partner. We barely get to see each other. Or, oh, you know, what are my kids, I can't disappear for 20 minutes. They need me. Well, really, does your partner or do your kids want 20 more minutes of tired, stressed out you? Absolutely not. And it's, the world it's, doesn't need that. It's bullshit. You spend 20 minutes on your phone sometimes not doing anything while they're there. You freaking know it or shopping on random stuff for Amazon. So it's just one of those, I don't have time to go to the gym, same kind of things. It's like, yeah. yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes. yes. <laughs> and when you do it, and you see the payoff, then you want to do it. Exactly. And that's, it brings us back to what we talked about at the beginning. If there's an ROI, there's a right. positive feedback loop. <laughs> and you know it's really important to watch for this. Mm -hmm. So when somebody starts meditation, I tell them, do a research project. And the title right. of this research is Maybe It's Meditation. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's meditation. And just nice. watch for anything that changes, right. anything at all, that you might be able to attribute to this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was a little nicer. Oh, I was a little more direct. Oh, I got through that quickly. Oh, I responded to that email that's been hanging around for ages. Oh, I only, I, you know, I didn't feel like I needed half a glass of wine to relax. I meditated and I felt fine. Interesting. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's meditation. Mm -hmm. And you start to build 
a body of evidence for yourself mm -hmm. that this is worth doing. And yep. that evidence is there if you pay attention. Yeah, then you end up like me in a hotel room with your four kids sleeping in there and you're in the corner in the dark just crawling into the chair so you can meditate and not wake anybody up because it, you, it, at that point you want to. I want to be there, you know, and you do get there when you notice all you're getting. And I always tell my clients when they, um, I'm like, you're not going to be a hundred percent. Like you're every day for the rest of your life, you're going to meditate now. Like you're going to have days you do and days you don't. And you might like kind of get out of practice for like a week and then get back into it. And that's good because I want you to see, I want you to just notice how you feel when you're consistently meditating. And when you're not just notice the differences. And once you start noticing those differences, you're just like, well, I would like to live this life actually. And then it becomes easy sure. from there. That is great. That is so, great. New York meditation center.com or London, yes. right? London. And London meditation center.com um, center R E in London, the English spelling <laughs> and ER uh, for New York. You can find us on Instagram by searching London meditation and New York meditation. And can I just pitch my, my partner's yes, book? That's what I was going to ask. What, how can people learn? Yes. So this is why meditate. Oh, it's not, it's not coming into focus. Here we go. It'll come why meditate? Focus. Because it works. You can get this on Amazon really quickly and it will explain nice. in even greater detail. Um, so that's Jillian Lavender is the author. She's, she's both my personal partner and, and we, we teach together. Um, we have colleagues scattered around the world. So if you reach out to us, if you can't find yourself in London or in New York, though those places are easy to get to and it's a really nice way to go away and spend a few days and learn. We have a, people who fly in both to both cities from all over the world in order to learn. You've got to learn in person. You got to learn in person. This is easy, but it is subtle and it needs refined experience in the early days. And once you know how to do it, you have it for life yeah. and you have all kinds of access to us going forward. We do lots of online meditations with hundreds of people online. Once you learn, you'll love, love doing that. Please join us for, for one of those, Tara. It would be great to, to have okay. you. And, uh, and you know, we, we do retreats in Portugal and in India and cool. in, around the UK. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do and plug in. So please be in contact with us. We would... Uh, we would love to hear from your listeners. And this becomes foundational for all the other work that you do and everything that you're doing. Uh, thank you for your work. And, mm. and thank you for, for this thank podcast you. because you're, you're changing people's lives. Thanks. I mean, it came, the reason I'm doing it is I was meditating one day and it was like, you're doing a podcast right yes. when I got done. I was like, okay, I don't know how to do a podcast, but okay. I kind of got, you remind me, I, I pitch, I pitch Jillian's <laughs> book and I forget my own podcast, which is oh, called yeah. <laughs> speaking of meditation. If you search speaking that, of wherever meditation? You, speaking, of, speaking of meditation, cool. okay, yeah. we'll interesting link up conversations with fascinating people. Okay, awesome. I will check that out personally and we'll link it up in the show notes and we'll also link up the book and both your New York Meditation Center and the London Meditation Center websites. And you guys can check out the retreats or the different in-person events and all the info there. Michael, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank very, you, what a um, pleasure. Applicable meditation. I, I feel like the way you approach meditation is very applicable to me and my crew. So it's appreciated. That's great. That's great. <laughs> I did your group. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>